When I was a child, I spent a lot of time at the library. I loved books. I loved words. I loved the way that people put words together. And what I really enjoyed is the way that people put words together to take something really complex and make it simple. I think James Baldwin did that beautifully when he described poverty. When he says, anyone who has ever struggled with poverty in this country understands how expensive it is to be poor. Anyone who has struggled with poverty in this country understands how expensive it is to be poor. I remember when I first started to understand the cost of poverty, what I like to call the poverty tax. And I think about school. And I used to be on something they called free and reduced lunch. And what that meant is for kids that came from a, soci a certain socioeconomic background, they got this booklet and it was blue. And what you were charged with doing was before you could get breakfast, you had to tear out this little square and you had to hand it to the lunch person and you got your breakfast. And it was lunchtime, you had to tear out another square and you hand it to the lunch person and you got your lunch. But the blue ticket became powerful when I started to understand that everyone didn't have one. There were some kids who were walking up to that lunch counter and just giving their name. You see, they had an account. And I started to understand how poor it can feel, how expensive it can feel to be poor. And I started to call these things blue ticket moments. And I remember one of the other big blue ticket moments was also around school and it was also around this time where there was a lot of conversation regarding the quality of education in large urban centers, quote unquote, the inner city. And one of the new big ideas was that we were going to bus kids from one community to another community where they had better schools. And what that meant in real terms was that I was getting up around five o'clock in the morning to get to a bus stop around 545. And it was as dark as this picture seems. And I would be on that bus for 60 to 90 minutes. And we would get to school, the bus would pull up right there in front and we would be getting off that bus headed to breakfast and other kids would be getting out of their cars headed to breakfast with more sleep. It was a blue ticket moment because I was also headed into breakfast where I had to pull out another blue ticket and have another blue ticket moment. I also remember in school times of great joy where we would be putting on a performance and we had our little costumes, we had our little lines, and we were practicing and everybody was excited because each grade was going to have their moment on stage. And they had invited parents and guardians to be in the audience. And I remember being on the stage and I remember there were kids who were looking into the eyes of their parents and guardians. And there were kids like me and we were also looking to the eyes of their parents and guardians because I knew my mom wasn't going to be there because she had a job that if you don't go to work, you don't get paid. A blue ticket moment. How expensive it can be to be poor. You know, Audre Lord talks about folks don't live single issue lives because they don't have a single issue struggle. People don't have a single issue struggle because they don't live single issue lives. At Jeremiah program for the past 20 years, we've been really holding the importance of the family unit. 
We've been really holding that you have to invest in the mom and the kid if you are going to disrupt generational poverty. Over the last year, we've been even more reflective and started to really pull on the lever of what we're calling the inside out strategy, really putting moms and kids at the center of everything we do. We feel that they are the unit of change. And so what does that mean? It's the lens in which we do the work. And one of the lenses is generational poverty is a social justice issue. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you have to acknowledge that providing a mom with a job, that is important. By providing a mom with a home, that is important. By providing a mom with access to education, that is important. But it is deeply insufficient if you are going to disrupt generational poverty. That will only allow you to play Mwakamo. You have to acknowledge that in order to have a unjust public educational system, you also have to have an unjust housing system. You have to have an unjust health justice system in order to have an unjust criminal justice system. You have to be willing to hold the complexity of the ecosystem of injustice in our country. It's about getting at the root of what has to be true for us to forecast with high levels of fidelity that someone born into poverty will remain in poverty. It's dealing with the top of the plant, but also being willing to deal with the challenging, the complex root. Generational poverty is a social justice issue. It's one of the lens, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge. The second lens that we've really been focusing on is reframing the conversation. Reframing the conversation and acknowledging the conscious and unconscious bias we have in this country regarding poverty and single moms. And we deeply believe there's a correlation, the same way that Brene Brown's research talks about. Resiliency and shame and identity de development. We think that shame and that resiliency also shows up regarding how a mom thinks about their ability to bet on themselves as well as betting on their child. We think that shame also plays into college persistence and graduation. Vincent Tinto has done some incredible work as a researcher in higher ed around the sense of belonging. What happens when we refocus the conversation and we start to acknowledge the way we have around crack. We were crack addicts in the 80s. Now, with the opioid crisis and because it is infiltrating other families and sitting at other tables, we're starting to think about it as a mental health issue. And we're starting to understand the grace of addiction being a mental health issue. We're also looking at our criminal justice system differently because more people are finding themselves arrested because of the opioid crisis. And we're talking about things like folks are no longer convicts. They're formally incarcerated, and some of us have even involved by returning citizens. Imagine if we brought that grace to single moms experiencing poverty, and they start with the baseline that there actually are great moms. And we start to acknowledge that middle class and upper middle class America don't have a monopoly on parenting. We start to acknowledge that poverty Families living in poverty doesn't mean that they're unhappy, that there is joy, the same way that there might be joy in middle class and upper middle class homes. Reframing the conversation and starting to understand the implications of how narratives influence identity. And this last lens is around expanding the leadership tent. Oftentimes, we think about leaders once you have accomplished the degree, once you have accomplished making X, once you have the title, and we deeply believe by creating spaces for moms to be leaders as they move along that economic mobility ladder, that something powerful happens. Our moms start to not only want to reimagine and redefine for their families, but they also start to want to redefine and reimagine for their communities. And they understand they have a role in doing that also for their country. When they, we expand the leadership tent and we let them know that when you walk into that college classroom, you are a leader 
and you bring all of your identities, you pack them up and you put them in the book bag and you bring them and you sit them in that classroom when you're talking about economics. You talk about what it means to experience poverty through that lens. You bring the fact that you're a single mom and you sit it in that economics classroom and you let folks grapple with the complexity of how our country is structured. We deeply believe that folks most proximate to the issue, like our moms, should also be most proximate to the mic. We do not think that we are going to be able to deliver incredible ideas and solutions by just wanting moms to be at tables of positional power. We have to create a space for them to be able to influence the agenda. And for many of you, you're feeling like this is overwhelming. Where do I fit in? How do I actually take this on? The complexity of it all. I want you to channel Shirley Chisholm because I want you to remember and just imagine. Imagine if the lunch person had said, I don't take blue tickets in my line. I'm going to create a list and I'm going to check off names. She would have diffused the blue ticket moment. Imagine if the bus driver says, you know what? It's not a policy to pull up in front of the school. I'm going to pull up on the side of the school and let the kids go into the side gate. He could have diffused the blue ticket moment. Imagine if a mom would have said, you know what? I'm the PTA president. We do three events this every year. One of those are going to be after school because we want to make sure that as many parents can come and while they're picking up their kids, we could all go ahead and have the programming. That could have diffused a blue ticket moment. Yes, what we're talking about, generational poverty being a social justice issue is overwhelming. Some of us have the opportunity to hold and influence blue ticket moments that have reverberating impacts on communities on companies, on organizations. Some of us have the opportunity to influence the lunch line. We all matter. But you have to understand, as Shirley Chisholm said, don't wait for an invitation. If you don't have a seat at the table, you have to be willing to bring your folding chair. And I want you to know something. I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing to do. I want you to know that I'm committed to bringing my voting chair, but I'm also committed to taking up room today and every day. Join me.